one. This another installment or Reverend Dr. Clay Fox sermon series, The Vicarious Humanity of Jesus. We are learning about the book of Hebrews. Reverend Falk will take you through all the chapters. I am sure this part will interest you. If you have missed any of his series, they are available on this website under Reverend Clay Falk's messages. We look forward to seeing you at our Sunday morning worship services. Have a blessed week. Well, good morning. Hope you've had a good week. Hope you have. Uh, I was bothered this week. I was bothered with uh, what we're going to talk about today. Because uh, there are some Sundays when you, you know, I always ask you a question or I start out with, you know, something. I said, you know, today is one of those days that we're talking about the vicarious humanity, what God... I'm going to give you the, the story. Here's what we're going to talk about. What God has done to you and for you through Jesus Christ, that is that vicarious humanity that not only taking your place on the cross, but taking your place as a human being in birth, life, the death and the resurrection, the ascension of everything. And, and I was bothered by the fact that today we're going to talk about perseverance, and, and that's okay. But by our faith, we are known. By our faith, we are known. And I started thinking about it, and I said, I'm sure i got a lot of good people sitting here that, that uh, and, and really this sermon probably, this message is probably more for somebody, somebody in that pew right there, or that pew, or that pew. You know who I'm talking about? Somebody's not here. And, and sometimes I thought, well, all these good folks, you know, they, they know, they know perseverance, and, and by their faith... But the truth is we live in a world that is broken, it is evil, it is, there is a sense of powerful wrong in this world that I think in the 30 years I've been a pastor has just continued to get worse. And, and I thought, you know, are you known by your faith? Are you known by your faith? And I started thinking, you know, sometimes we have more faith in other things we have faith in our sports teams we have faith in our uh, jobs our 401s we have faith uh, somebody had a faith in the pew over there that cracked one sunday i found out that was wrong nope don't believe in the you know you sit down and mike said it was gail gail so it was my, i don't know who but at some point it broke ma'am He's not saying a word. It's her talking over here if you can't hear. She's pointing. Anyway. But no, that the people have faith in other things. They believe in other things before they believe in God, and they live it like they believe. It, it's like we, get, we put our head down to the plow, and we get busy, and we get, you know, you work and your job and your, son and your family and things and things and things and the drama, and, and we just keep. And at some point, we don't even look up to see what's going on in the world and around us, and it, some, somebody says, well, I'm happier that way. I get it, but the big picture is we live in a world that is continuing to just go down a, a path that is not biblical. I would love to stand up here and tell you I think that the world is getting better and the path is getting uh, uh, more right. It's not. 
It's not. And it's not do politics with this or that. They're all crooks. But, but the point is, it's about ethics and morals. Ethics and morals more than anything else going on in our world today. Um, it's about a pulling away from God. Uh, I, I gave this message at uh, the 850 service, and Randy Taylor, our, our resident retired pastor, he said, you know, he said, at some point we kick God out of America, God's going to be gracious and say, have at it. Here's your, here's your cup of tea. And that cup of tea is what we call the wrath of God. It's not that God's going to get us. It's that we're going to get ourselves in what we, how we live and what we do and our faith. You know, I bet you that williams Bryce Stadium will be pretty full this, this, at least first game or two. Don't you think? Probably. Clemson Stadium at Clemson will be pretty full. Panthers, well, I don't know about that. But most, most play, you know, and yet churches remain empty. Why is that? That's a tough one. Well, I don't like selling fire insurance. I like selling life insurance. So let me tell you what, uh, what chapter 10. We're going to cover 10 and 11. It's a lot of scripture. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for going, listening and, and reading along. And some Sundays, God bless, if uh, you leave here and go, that was awful. Um, I pray you come back the next week and give me a second chance. Because sometimes some of our Sundays are, are we do a lot. I, I, that was another thing. I said a lot of scripture today. Taylor, you're getting two doses of it. A couple of you getting two or three doses of it. Poor things. My goodness. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, it, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would, they, um, would they not stop? have stopped being offered, for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and no longer have felt guilty of their, for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. Therefore, in other words, the old law, the old sacrifice of bulls, goats, birds, whatever, grain, that was it. He said, but therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for just the people who show up to church. Is that what it says? Just the people who go to that certain church. It says all, once for all. See, here's the thought. Everybody riding down the highway that doesn't feel a need to come to church, whether they realize it or not, they are forgiven. Grace is like oxygen. It's there. I don't see it. It's there. It's there. I can feel it. Wind blows. I can feel it. I know it from that, but grace is there. And you can be the spoiled, rotten child and hold your breath if you so choose. You ever do that when you're a kid? <gasps> My mother said, good lung exercise. Yeah, you're not getting what you want. Or the worst is the mother going, <gasps> oh, get, I'll give it to you. Don't, don't hurt yourself. No, that's the worst. No, don't. But, but we're, we want what we want when we want it. We are spoiled. Or as my, my mother said, spoilt. I didn't know that was a word, but it is. Spoilt with a T on the end. You're spoilt. But true, spoiled. We are spoiled. We want what we want. We want. And here's the thing. You've been made, you've been forgiven. 
forgiven forever. He says day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, that is Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And you may remember last week we talked about the, the judge, and the judge sat in the center, and the scribes on each side of him, and the ones on the left were all guilty, and the ones on the right were all seen as innocent. They wrote their names down. Your name has been written on the right side of the judge, on the scroll that is the innocent. I love that. He says, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who were being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Once and for all. All as in everyone and all as in all time. The cross meant something. The modern church has done you a disservice by letting you think that once a year on Good Friday, the cross means something. The cross forgave your sin. Here's the struggle. And I get it. I see it on, you know, Facebook theology is really horrible at times. Sometimes you get it good, but, but most of the time it's really horrible. But, but the argument, that, and I just I laugh, is Jesus the only way? And the answer is absolutely. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to heaven. That is clear. And, and the cross not only showed us that, that death was not the last word, but it's his, his birth, his, his life. It's all parts of that. And, and there's this sense of God takes away the sin of yesterday, today, and even tomorrow. Now, you say, well, how can I, I thought I had to, con see, here's the thing. The modern church sometimes has fallen back on this foolishness of somehow if I don't, and, and I, I get different denominations and different <clears throat> Catholic, Protestant ideas are out there, but, but biblically speaking, the scripture says again and again, you have a great high priest, it is Jesus you don't need an earthly priest to make offerings. You can confess your sins. And when you confess your sins, you're not saying, hey, Lord, please, please forgive me. Oh, I hope you do. I'm not sure. I told you last week when you wake up in the middle of the night or you're trying to go to sleep, you're going, oh, I know I did the bad. Oh, Lord, have I done enough to get into heaven? Doubt creeps in. That's, that's Satan. Here's the truth. You are forgiven for all your sins. Even the ones you haven't committed yet. Well, how can that be, Pastor? Well, let me tell you. Living a life of repentance, and I've said this 40,000 times. I'll say it 40,000 more because it's so important. Living a life of repentance is simply saying, Oh, God, I need you every day. I fell short. I don't get it. I do things I shouldn't. I do things I don't do things I should. I leave things undone. Oh, Lord, I'm a mess. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the good news of the gospel. The good news is I'm forgiven. The good, if it was, if it wasn't, it would, it would be bad news if it was a constant worry. Did I get it right or am I good enough? Or will I have to go before God and answer before God and he'll stand there and go, oh, I don't know if you can make it in here or not. Have you been good enough? This isn't, that's Santa Claus. That's not Jesus. That's not the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I want you to know that. And here's the reason I say this. I want, I want. I sell life insurance, not fire insurance. We're going to talk about fire in just a minute. But I want you to come to church not because you're fearful that God's going to get you, but because God has already got you. That is just the truth. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Yes, God is love. And I hear these pastors. Because oh, here's the thing. We're talking about doing our will. <sighs> Jesus said, thy will be done. In a few minutes, we're going to say, you know, thy will be done in the Lord's Prayer. Ah, so often we go, yeah, that's on Sundays. The rest of the week's mine. I want my will done. <laughs> I want to do what I want to do. And that's really what's going on in our world is the world from day one when, when, <laughs> when, when the serpent said to Eve, 
he's holding something back from you. You're not getting, Eve, you're not getting everything you need, you want. And that's the world we live in. That's the lie, the constant lie to our world is that you need more, more, more stuff, stuff, stuff. You need, it's all about you, it's selfishness, self-centeredness. And the truth is, that's not Jesus at all. Jesus is about selflessness and love and grace, and it's been given to you, so enjoy it. So, you have a call to persevere, because if you don't go along with the go-alongs, you're going to be an outsider. And he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the, whole, the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain, that is, his body. Because remember, the Holy of Holies was closed off by a great big curtain, and it ripped in two the day that Jesus was crucified. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty con- a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed in pure water, with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For, we who, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, it's about what God has done for us and to us. And you can believe his promise. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So see, that again, the, the response to that grace, the response to the love, to, to all that you've been given, the response is to draw near to God. Draw near to God. Come to worship. Come, and, and like I've told people, if you don't like coming to this church, find one you do like. Go, to some, go somewhere where you hear the Bible taught and preached and spoken of, where people pray and sing. Make sure, but go. <laughs> it, it should be the most important appointment of your week. I don't say this because I want you to fill a pew these pews are not going to fly away i want it because i want your salvation i want my children i thought said that was my goal in life my fortune i want my children in heaven with me forever i want their children in heaven with me forever their spouses their families i want you i want your family i want everybody you love in heaven forever i do and that's what he's saying the day is approaching and if it isn't the day let me just tell i just did a funeral this week and the guy got sick on Friday, died by Sunday. It can happen fast. Not just car wreck. We're talking just physically got sick, died. That was it. If we deliberately, verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth. In other words, after you've heard this, the good news, and you decide I'm going to keep living the way I want to live, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation Now, this is scary. A fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant? that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, because you know what? As much as God is gracious and loving and caring, God is also polite. You know what I mean by polite? Polite means that if you don't want to ever come to his house, and hang out with him now, you certainly don't want to go and hang out in heaven with him forever and eternity. And he says, if you choose, you can choose as you please. I went and played golf this past week, Friday afternoon, got a chance to go hit the golf ball. When I say played, that's a loose term. I tell you, I tell you this all the time because this is so true to this particular series. It's the effort, it's not the score. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I had a great time with three of us, uh, three Christian brothers in Christ talking. And one says, do you believe you can lose your salvation? 
and, and I love, I had a good, solid other Christian guy with me, and he said, he said, yeah, he said, you can choose not to love God, but your salvation is still a gift. And I said, that, oh, I said, you guys aren't even theologians, and that's right. Because basically, if I write you a check and put it down right here and say it's a million dollars and you can, your name's on it and it's paper and you don't ever pick it up but it's sitting there and it finally washes away in the, in the water or whatever, flies away in the breeze, um, if you never cast it and enjoyed it, then you didn't get it. But it was there. It was yours. It was written in your name. You have grace. God loves you, but you can ignore that grace. People riding down the highway don't know God loves them and has given them everything they ever enjoyed in life. They just... They don't get it. I don't understand why, but they don't get it. The world has twisted their minds to thinking that they got it themselves or life's dealt them a terrible blow or they're just victims or whatever or what they do have, they got, you know, hey, you know, one of the ri- will money buy happiness? I, if it does, I, I, I might give it a shot, but I don't think it does, as the guy said. But I tell you what, I, richest man I ever, one of the richest men I ever met. Whew, he was known by his greed, not his love, not his faith. I'm telling you, that, that God, but God is gracious. Who sends people to hell? You do. You send yourself. And, and it's not like, and here's the thing, if you were worried about it, then you're good. It's the arrogant. It's the one who says, well, I go to church and I give and I do this, or I don't ever, I, I'm a good person, I don't need to go to church. Any of those, the ar- arrogance is not, Christian. Humility is Christian. Humility is saying, you know what, Lord? I need a Savior. Every day I am so broken. I am, I'm, I'm a mess. I need you, Lord. That is a daily walk. That is carrying your cross daily. He says, remember the early days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions, obviously, in heaven. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay and, but the righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. We are, you're saved. If, if, you, if you accept your acceptance and you decide, hey, you know what, I'm going to give my life to the Lord, thy will be done. And, and make it a priority. Your faith is a priority. Your faith. And that's what he's going to give an example. Person after person in this next chapter is all about someone who is known by their faith. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So that's faith. Good definition of faith. This is what the ancients wrote, were commended for. By faith, we understood that the universe was formed by God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In other words, we can tell you all day it was a bang or a creationism or whatever. You can argue whatever. That's not the point. The point is God did it. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. In other words, you remember that Abel was killed because he brought the better offering if you're a biblical. That's why you need to know the Bible. You need to read the Bible with with me and, and, and grow and learn in this is that biblical just literacy is so important. Cain, he, he, he's not remembered as somebody of faith. He's remembered as a murderer. First murderer in the Bible was Cain. He was jealous of his brother for bringing. Cain said, can I bring the crap to God and let, let, let that do? Won't that be enough if I bring my least? And then God said to Abel, you brought your best. That's what I expect. Don't bring your worst. And then Cain got jealous and killed Abel because he brought the good. But fascinating there. My goodness. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. 
he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it was impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in other words, the flood, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. In other words, he probably would have let more people on, but God closed the door to the ark. And those folks, unfortunately, perished. By faith, Abraham was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. Obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. In other words, God it's all about God, God's promises, God's promises, God's promises. And God has promised you salvation because of your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, and so, from this one man, and he, as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. In other words, this is not your home. This is a temporary stop. You've been hanging out just in a holding pattern. You have not gotten home yet. You are stranded out in the wilderness, basically. And please do not think that your 401k, your job, your family, your kids, that's what Hebrews, that's what the opening credit said on the video. None of that is superior to the Lord God Almighty. And basically all it is is trappings. Do not get fooled into believing what you see that the world shows you. He says, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. I want to live where I want. I want to do as I want to do, and I want to be as I want to be. And doggone it, you better say it's okay. Don't you say it's not biblical. Don't you say it's not ethical. Don't you say it's not moral. I want what I want. I'm looking for my own country. I want to do as I please. That's what the Bible, this is, oh, folks, this, the Bible's speaking to us today from thousands of years ago. I mean, it is speaking to us. It is telling us. This is the world we live in. It's not new. It's been like this for ages. But I don't think it's getting better. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, I love this, reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And in so, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob, and he saw in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him from, for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter and stay rich. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. 
he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab. He just named a prostitute in the Bible. The prostitute Rahab is in the Old Testament. Because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. It, that, there's more to that. It's not just about being released. They re, refused to, um, to, to rebuff what they said about Jesus being alive. They, uh, they were tortured because of their faith. If they would recant what they said, they would be let go. Some faced jeering, jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, they were sawed in two, and they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. Jesus says when you go visit somebody and they treat you bad, you know what you're supposed to do when you walk out? Shake the, wipe, the, wipe your feet because there's more poop in the house than there is out in the, in the street. That's, that's, that's when, you treat, when you're treated bad. It said they wandered in deserts and mountains and living in caves and holes in the ground. They were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Oh, that's a lot of reading, folks. But it's important because you need to know Scripture. And when we read stuff like that, I'm telling you, it just harkens, it makes you realize the world we live in is just so crazy. And, and the, the, the theology, and the, you need to know what the Bible is. Somebody gets on their Facebook warrior say, oh, this about Jesus or that's about God. I've even, I've looked at, oh, my goodness. And there's no point in arguing with people online. I'd rather just teach you the truth here and now. But so often I hear that people have their own truths and, and they believe what they want to believe. It reminds me of a um, story I heard one time about uh, somebody bringing a box of, of chocolate chip cookies to, to somebody, and they said, hey, there's a box of chocolate chip cookies, and they opened it, and I said, ooh, that smells good. And they said, well, we only had one, well, there's only one morsel in there that was a, um, a dog, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, what? Which one of those are you going to eat? And the answer would be none of them. But the world wants you to eat all of them and, and believe everything that's said. And whatever you want to do is what you want to do. And you do as you please. And, and that's freedom. I don't want to be free. I want to be under the rule and, and the, the leadership of the Lord. I want to be in his kingdom. I don't want my kingdom. My kingdom's junk. My kingdom will never look like his kingdom. I can build. I can put it together. I can 401s and savings and investments and retirement. Uh, Isn't that great? And we retire. What age do most people retire? 65, 70? If you're lucky, you were rich and you did it at 50 or something like that. But you know what the truth is? You can get all that for how many years to come? 10, 20, 30? met a man. He'd retired in his 60s and he lived to be 100 that's almost what 40 he still died he didn't take it with him I hope he loved Jesus 
That's, I got a retirement plan. It's in heaven. And it's better than anything else this world offers. Because this is not my home. This is not your home. So as we leave and as we've got two more chapters when we come back next week for Hebrews and we'll move forward. But I just want you to know you have been loved and saved. You have been made special. You have been made righteous. You will have to persevere. But in the end of the day, I want you to be known by one thing. Your faith. Be known by your faith. How much you loved, how much you gave, how much you did good deeds for people. But all of those, not to glorify you, but to glorify the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. May God bless you. I pray it's been a blessing to you. I appreciate you being here. And again, it's all about our relationship with the Lord Almighty. I pray that the words today and today's the future, whether I preach well or you like it or don't like it, but when you come... The Holy Spirit grabs it and throws it the way you need to hear it in your ears. And may you be blessed and go into the world sharing the good news. God loves you. Your sins are forgiven. Now go and live for Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.